now that we've looked at what manuscripts are, what content is in them, and the types of manuscripts that you can find, we better turn our attention to how you actually go about finding research literature to read. So there are a few contents here today. We'll talk about using plain text searches for topics, for example, that you might be interested in learning about. And then we're gonna to turn to how do you actually get the content of the manuscript itself after you do a search, ways to get started finding relevant research literature. And then we'll talk briefly about how, how citations are formatted. And we'll end with a quick note about a new type of manuscript called a preprint. So first, where do you go to start looking for research literature, be it primary research literature or review papers or so forth? You can easily Google or use any other search engine on the web to look for content. You can definitely use Wikipedia. And I'm gonna to highlight today the two with asterisks, Googling as one approach to finding research literature, and also a database called PubMed which is specific to life sciences and biomedical research. So this isn't, this isn't useful for every discipline on the planet, even in, even in STEM. It's specific to biomedical and life science research. So the other thing we're gonna focus on today is how to get to the manuscript itself, starting with a web-based search. And I'm focusing here on getting free PDFs of the manuscripts online. So I'm not talking about things like how you can go to your library and get a research paper or going to the journal website and buying a subscription to the journal. We're going to focus purely on using the web to find, hopefully, free versions of the PDFs of research manuscripts that you are looking for. So let's say, for example, that I am interested in learning more about stickleback fish sex chromosome evolution. So I've gone to a Google search engine page, I've typed that query in, and I've got some results here. And not surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, some of the top hits in the Google search result are two manuscripts. And I know that because I can see the URL is listed as pubmed.ncbi.nlm.nih, excuse me, .gov. PubMed is one of those databases that accesses tables of contents, re published research literature, and indexes them. PubMed is a search engine, and I'm going to show you that one next after we're done with Google. PubMed is part of the National Library of Medicine, which is the NLM part of this URL. Okay, so let me pick a paper... So turnover of sex chromosomes in the stickleback fishes by me and other authors. So again, the goal here is I want the actual paper. I have found a title of a paper that I think might be relevant. So let's see. So again, we in that search result, we just had the title. We've got the list of authors. We've got a digital object identifier, a DOI link. Most papers in the 2000s and beyond, you won't find these on earlier papers, each have a unique digital object identifier, DOI. So this paper is sort of like its barcode, in a sense. This paper's specific DOI is highlighted here, and that's a unique link that will bring any web browser to this research article. So you might want to keep that in mind because if you find a DOI link somewhere, that's what it means. If you click it, it should take you to the journal page for that article. So here we are at the journal PLOS Genetics, Public Library of Science Genetics so is a journal. And I want to get the paper. So where's the paper? I see the abstract, the author summary, figures, and uh, if we scroll farther down, Here's the introduction. You've got the whole journal in web format right here. You can navigate it on the left side here by jumping to the different sections of the research paper. What I want is the PDF and typically at the top of any journal page, if the journal is free to you and you have access to it, either it's open access and no one had to pay for it, which is true here. It says open access here in the upper left. Or if you happen to be on a university campus, for example, and your university library has paid access to it, 
you should find somewhere at the top of the page a download PDF button. Click the button, it downloads the PDF of this paper for you. You're ready to go. Go read the paper. So here it is in web format on this web page. You can also download it as a PDF. So that's using Google to find literature. We can also go to PubMed, which I already mentioned, this database that's hosted by the National Library of Medicine. It's a US government website. And you can do exactly the same here as you would do in Google, but this is specifically searching research literature, well, journal articles, not just research literature. You can find news and views and review articles and so forth here as well. But PubMed has specifically chosen a subset of all of the journals in the world that it has indexed. So you only get results from certain typically high quality peer reviewed journals when using PubMed, as opposed to doing something like Googling, where you have to do a bit more work to be assured that you found valid and peer reviewed research. So here I'll use the exact same phrase, stickleback sex chromosome evolution and search now PubMed. And it gives us a list of these manuscripts, some of which seem to do with sticklebacks and some of which are, in this case of number two, a related, well, it's not even a related fish. It's a fish, so it's related, but not closely related to sticklebacks. So here's a list of research papers that we might want to read all of if we're interested in learning about sex chromosome evolution in stickleback fish. Now I'm going to pick on this last one, the 10th one in this page, and there are more results. So you can keep clicking next and next and next and see all of the results for this search. A role for a neosex chromosome and stickleback speciation, a publication from Nature in the year 2009. Here's its digital object identifier, that unique label or barcode number for this specific article. And importantly, here at PubMed, you can see that it's got a PubMed ID number. That's a separate unique identifier for this paper, kind of like a DOI. Importantly, it says that there's a free PMC or PubMed Central article. If you see that in a PubMed search, it means there's a free version of this paper that you can access. So let's go. So we'll select the link, the title of the paper. And in a PubMed entry, You'll see the title, the list of authors, the abstract, the PubMed ID number again, its digital object identifier number. And importantly, always at the top of the page, if there's a link to getting the PDF, it'll be somewhere up here where you start on the page. There are two full text links here. One is to Nature Publishing Group. That is a link that will take you to the Nature Journal website. And there's one that says free full text PMC, PubMed Central. This is guaranteed to lead you to the free text of that article. You can download it here in the upper right hand corner again as a PDF. If instead you follow the link to the Nature Publishing Group website, this tells me that my university, Fresno State, has access, and right now I'm in my office on campus, so my internet is connected to the Fresno State internet, I have free access here. Sometimes if you go to the journal website, you won't have free access to the journal version of the paper, but if it says there's a free PubMed central version, you can always download that through the free PMC link and download the PDF of that primary literature article. Introduction, materials and methods, results, discussion, citations, all of it. Now, one more point before we move on, a little quick thing, another tip for if you can't find a free version of a PDF somewhere, if you keep clicking on links and it keeps taking you to journals and it says you don't have access, you have to pay us like $400 for 10 hours of access, there's one other thing you might try. There are actually many things, but this is the next thing that I always do. On the first page, look for the individual author that is listed as the corresponding author. And typically that has to do with some of these 
superscript numbers and symbols next to individuals' names. So often you have to scroll down to the bottom of the page to find correspondence and requests for materials should be addressed to CLP, the author with initials CLP, which in this case is Catherine Peichel. What I would do if I got an abstract and I knew I wanted this paper, but I couldn't find any free links to PDFs, go to the corresponding author's professional website. So at this point, Katie, Dr. Peichel, worked at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, institution number one here in the list. So what I would do next in a last case sort of scenario is I would Google or do a web search for Catherine Peichel, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and see if I can find, does she have a website that's hosted by that cancer research center? Most faculty members, most scientists, not just faculty members, if they have a professional website, they will have a page on their professional website that is a list of the papers that they have published. Many scientists that have those literature pages on their professional website, some of them, many of them, have links to PDFs that they are hosted at their own professional website so that you don't have to access them through the journal, especially when the journal wants you to pay to access it. So now that we know how to get PDFs or web pages that contain the literature we want, we should probably continue talking about how to start finding relevant literature if you're trying to explore a new topic, for example. We've already talked about primary literature and how to use primary literature to get information. You read the paper, you can follow the citations in the paper, but sometimes that's a hard way to get into a new field. So as I mentioned in a different video, I like to use review papers. We'll also talk about Wikipedia briefly. Okay. So let's talk about finding review papers. So let's say that I want to find out something about mitochondria. It's my area of expertise, which is why I'm picking it. So I've gone to the PubMed website and I've entered mitochondria and the word review into the search bar. And so here are the results from PubMed. Again, we have the title, the list of authors, the citation, the journal, and so forth information. Now, not only do we have free PMC article, which means that if I follow this link, I can get the full text of this paper. It is a review paper. It says that right there in the citation. And in fact, all of these are reviews because I asked for that as part of my search query. So this means none of these are primary research articles. These results are all reviews. So let's take a look at the first one. So I've clicked, now I've got the record for this specific article. Again, it has its own unique digital object identifier. We've got the authors. And as usual, we have the full text links. We can get the full text from the journal itself, the journal Cell, where this was published in 2012. Or we can get the PubMed Central version, which is just by choice, the one I'm going to choose. So here we go. We're going to read this review article about mitochondria. So mitochondria in sickness and in health. And I'm reading along. And let's say I want to use this to cite when I want to make the point that I think mitochondria are always maternally inherited, which hopefully is something you learned in biology class, that we always inherit, or almost always, truthfully, inherit our mitochondria from our mothers at birth. So, for example, we have this first paragraph of the introduction, where mitochondria came from, and this last sentence, in animals, mitochondrial DNA inheritance is almost exclusively maternal, and paternal mitochondria is actively destroyed in many species immediately after fertilization. So if I was writing something and I wanted to cite the cause of why mitochondrial DNA is always inherited from mothers and never from fathers, well, here's that information. Paternal in mitochondrial DNA is actively destroyed in many species following fertilization. The question is, 
what do we cite as the source of this information? Do we cite this review paper, which stated that fact right here? No. We need to follow the references at the end of that sentence, which are the papers, the primary research papers that generated the data that made that point. So we would want to read these two references and cite one or both of them if what we are doing as authors or researchers is trying to make the point to somebody else that mitochondria are inherited from mothers because dad's mitochondrial DNA gets destroyed at fertilization. So how do we get these papers, right? We did a PubMed search to find this review paper we're looking at. How are we gonna find these two papers? In this particular case, the PubMed central version of the manuscript, if you hover over a reference, it gives you the full citation, including links to the PubMed entry, for example, for those two references. Or you can click on the link itself instead of just hovering the mouse, and it will drop you down to the references section where you can find, again, the full citation for this paper. So now what we really need to be able to do is to understand what the heck is all of the information that, are, that is in a citation, because this is full of a lot of information that's important for scientists to figure out how to get this citation, the actual text of these citations. So let's take a look at citation formats briefly. And again, remember, the key point there was when you're looking at review papers, typically you want to cite the primary literature that's discussed in the review paper, not the citation of the review paper itself. Okay, so a couple points. When you're reading those paragraphs of text in review papers or in primary research literature, there's in-text citations that are sometimes listed as, for example, for me, Joe Ross, might be Ross et al. 2019 as the in-text citation, you would then look up in the references section at the bottom of the paper to find the full citation. Some other journals just use a number like reference 28 would be a particular reference. Now also note that when you get down to the bottom of the paper and you look at the references section or the literature cited section, depending on which it's called, different journals have different formats. Nobody in biomedical research literature, life science research, or at least with rare exception, perhaps nobody uses the APA or the MLA formats for references. Each journal or each family of journals has its own particular structure of formats. So let me just walk you through one that's one we just looked at recently, the Al Rawi et al. paper from a couple of slides ago. We'll take a look at this citation here from the references section, right? The citation itself I've highlighted here in the bottom of these different colored boxes. And also note that in this case, I'm specifically talking about citation formats for journal articles. That could be review articles or primary research articles. I'm just saying this is not books or an encyclopedia or some other uh, material that you've accessed. So specifically journal articles. At the bottom, we have the list of the authors, last name first, then first initial. No punctuation other than commas between the author's names. That will vary from journal to journal, sometimes periods after the first initial, sometimes not, and so forth. Sometimes an and between the second to last author's name and the last author's name, sometimes not. Ignore the subtleties. We've got the list of authors. Then we've got the title, wraps around to the second line, post-fertilization autophagy of sperm organelles, etc. So the title of the paper. Some journals, it's in quotes. Some journals, the citation is not in quotes, right? Varies from journal to journal. Then we have the name of the journal. In this case, the journal Science italicized. That's important. Then we have the year, 2011. So that's the year that this author, this journal was published, the journal that contains this manuscript. Then the number 334, which is the volume number. So most journals start by publishing volume number one, which is the first set, first collection of articles that they've published, and then volume two. Maybe the next year, maybe it's a quarterly journal, so maybe you have one 
maybe you have four volumes a year. It varies by journal. And then we have the page range, pages 1144 to 1147. This is a typical citation format. It gives a scientist all of the information we need to go find this article. We could Google the first author's name. We could Google the title, which is often what I do, use any sort of web search, not specifically Google, but Google the entire title. Or if you need to go to a library, you would know that you need to look at the 2011 print version of the journal Science, and you'd be looking for volume number 334. And then when you've got that physical magazine, you could flip to page 1144 and start reading this article. So that's typical format. So generically speaking, it's the list of authors in some format, followed by the year, sometimes in parentheses, the title, in this case, I've suggested it might be in quotation marks. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. The name of the journal is always in italics. So you should always italicize the journal name. Then we have the volume number, which is almost always in bold. So that's why I have in the bottom here, punctuation and formatting counts. This helps us figure out what numbers mean what. Name of the journal, volume number in bold. If there is an additional set of numbers in parentheses, that would be the issue number. So for example, again, maybe a journal publishes one volume each year. And let's say it's a monthly publication. So there's a January and a February and a March. They're all the same volume. So it might be volume one. So the January issue might be issue one. So that'd be volume one, issue one is January of that year. Volume one, issue two would be February of that year. Volume one, issue three would be March of that year, and so on. Then the page range. And then sometimes, recently, you'll have the digital object identifier also as part of the citation. Now, a couple of final points as we wrap up. One is figuring out the name of the journal. In a citation, sometimes really long journal names will get abbreviated into some truncated form of the full journal name. And that can make it hard for you to figure out what's the name of the journal I'm looking for to find a particular article that's in a citation. So for example, one question I'm gonna ask that we can do right now is what journal, if we found this, it should be italicized as part of a citation, J. Lynn Sock. What journal is that? And how would we find it if we had to go to a library, for example, and look for it. So I'm going to return us back to the mitochondria review we were looking at. And I'm going to pick a, another reference. Let's say this Tarantiadal 1997 paper, reference number 196. We find the journal name. It's in italics, Hummel Gannett. What the hell does that mean? To figure out what a, this is a great tip, by the way, you will use this, I guarantee it, if you stay in science, which I hope you will, if you need to know in life sciences or biomedical sciences what the acronym of a journal is, go to PubMed. So here I'll follow the PubMed link. So here's the PubMed entry for this paper. And here's again that citation, Human Molecular Genetics is the name of the journal. The way you find that out is notice that it's a link, the name, the abbreviation of that journal. If I click on it, it gives me some actions. What you want to do, if you want to know what the real name of the journal is, the full name, search in NLM catalog, the National Library of Medicine catalog. Search the catalog for that journal name, and it will bring you this record for the journal. So now it tells you, oh, okay, the abbreviation that the National Library of Medicine uses is Hummolganet. And other people also use that same abbreviation, although with different capitalizations. But the full name of the journal is the title, Human Molecular Genetics. And it gives you other information that's useful about this journal too, if you really need details, like how frequently it's published. When it started, which publisher, which press publishes it, and so forth. Okay, so that's a great way to figure out what the abbreviation of a title actually is, again, limited to life sciences biomedical journals. 
So back to my question that I posed a couple of minutes ago, how would we figure out what the journal J. Linsock stands for? Go to the NCBI website. Out of all of the databases, again, pick the one that we want for journal names, NLM catalog, put in your abbreviation that you're curious about, and search. And we'll discover that the Linnaean Society of London has one journal that's the Biol J. Linsock Lund, and another one that's called the Bot J. Linsock. So these two journals both contain our search term. So if we click on that, we will find the full name of this journal and its abbreviation. Biol J. Linsock Lund stands for the Biological Journal of the Linnaean Society. Okay, so great tip. PubMed, NLM catalog, put in the shortened version, the abbreviation of a journal, you have no idea what it is, and you can find the full name here. And now for our final two topics for this video. One, quick tip about Wikipedia. You can certainly, and I will argue with people that disagree with me, you can certainly use Wikipedia as a sort of a review article to get you started in learning about some topic. Just make sure that you read and cite the primary literature. Just like you would not necessarily cite a review manuscript, you definitely should not cite a Wikipedia page as the source of knowledge. So to highlight that point, let's take a look at Wikipedia. So in this case, I have Googled the term mitochondria. I wanna learn more about mitochondria. And if I scroll down, then oh, there's the Wikipedia entry for mitochondria. So let's take a look at what Wikipedia has to say about mitochondria. So they were discovered in 1857 in the voluntary muscle of insects, the term was coined and so forth. So if you want to use any of this information, note the critical part here is that this is a great summary of mitochondria. You would not cite this page, follow the citation. So here in Wikipedia, in-text citations are these superscript numerals in brackets. And if you wanted in a report, for example, to write that mitochondria are the organelles that generate ATP in this second sentence, you probably want to go look at citation two, which will take you to the list of citations for this Wikipedia entry on mitochondria. Now the trick is we need to know which of these many, 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 many citations, these references, are to what we're looking for, which is primary research literature, and not to things that are not primary research literature. So how could we do that? We have to know something about how to read these citations. So Campbell's Biology Exploring Life here, Citation 2, is a book. And we could follow this ISBN link to find out what the book is. I'm guessing it's probably a textbook, which is not primary research literature. Reference three is from Science in the News, which is not a journal. This is probably a news article, not primary research literature. Powerhouse of the Cell, 1957, a Scientific American piece. So we need to know that Scientific American is not a journal that publishes primary research, so we would not use that as a citation. Finally, just for an example for now, we get to reference five, which is Evolutionary Biology Essence of Mitochondria, published by Nature. Is it primary research? Well, what do we do? If we want to read it, let's go to the PubMed ID link. And here we find it's a comment article. It's not primary research. This is a comment article. And there is no free full text link for us. So I can't even read it. So I'm just going to ignore that one. Because I already know it's not primary research literature. It's a commentary article. So last, I know I said that was already the last reference eight, let's say, for example. 
This parasite lacks a mitochondrial genome published in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Let's go to the PubMed ID link and see if we think this is primary research or not. Doesn't say it's a review, doesn't say it's a commentary. This looks like a research article that we could then read and ensure that that primary research article says in it, in its data, what the Wikipedia author said this article says. Click on that link, read the full text, cite this research paper as the source of that information if this is important to you and to your project. So again, please use Wikipedia as a review. Just make sure you follow from the written work in Wikipedia to the references at the bottom. Read and cite primary literature research references from there. And in one last final little point, preprints. There are publications that are manuscripts that authors have written, like we talked about in an earlier video, that they have not yet sent to a journal for peer review. And authors can send those not yet peer reviewed papers, manuscripts, to preprint servers, which are websites that accept these publications, not yet peer reviewed publications. They accept them and they post them for anybody to read and download. So the main thing to be aware of here is if you see anything that where the journal says something like archive or bioarchive, that's the hint to you that what you're about to look at is not peer-reviewed published research. And you should definitely check with whoever you're writing or working for to see if it's okay or not okay to cite work that's in a preprint. Because again, those preprints have not been peer-reviewed yet. So a lot of organizations will not accept those as acceptable for sources for information that you might need. All right, so today we covered plain text searching, web search for text, something that you want to learn about, how to actually get to the PDF or the web-based version of the full text of the manuscript, ways to get started, like using Wikipedia or finding review articles, how to read a citation, what's in a citation, and how to find the name of a journal when it's an abbreviated journal name. And we just talked about preprints. Now you know a lot that you need to know to get started and to continue working with research literature in the biomedical and life sciences. Thanks for watching and spending time with me.